All right, we're back. So we just talked about the source. Uh, that's how we're going to refer to um, the glottis and the waves that it produces and voicing and uh, F0 and all of those properties. They're all source properties. So you can think of the entire speech apparatus as basically having a source, which is at your glottis, uh, and that gives the input uh, to articulation. Uh, and then it's going to also have a filter, um, and the filter is going to do some things to that input uh, that help shape it uh, to the output of speech, which is basically waves in the air, pressure waves in the air that you hear or record in a microphone or whatever. Um, so the source is going to define the input, but before you output it from your mouth, uh, you're going to do various things in your vocal tract to filter it, and that's what this part is about. Um, what's happening so far? In voice sounds, we have the vocal folds vibrating, and they're feeding energy or waves of pressure into a speaker's vocal tract above the glottis at a whole bunch of different frequencies. Uh, and these are uh, the frequencies are harmonics, which are integer multiples of F0. That's what we just did. So what's going to happen uh, once that acoustic energy is being fed upwards into the vocal tract? Well, the vocal tract is essentially a column of air. Uh, in fact, in basic sort of phonetics, we often model the vocal tract as a tube uh, where the, you can change the shape of the tube by moving your articulators. Um, it's going to be a column of air. Uh, and just like any physical body, uh, a body of air, a body of metal, a body of wood, a body of uh, human skin and bone and tissue, uh, that column of air has some characteristic or natural resonant frequencies. Um, which depend on the shape of the column of air. Uh, and that is not specific to your vocal tract. This is true of any object in the natural world, right? So the column of air in your vocal tract works a lot like the column of air in a bottle with a certain amount of liquid in it. Um, and so if you've ever tried this thing where you blow across the top of a bottle uh, and it makes a particular sound, it's going to be a periodic sound with a fundamental frequency. It's basically like a musical note, kind of like a flute. Uh, the pitch of that sound is going to depend on how big the column of air is. In other words, uh, how much liquid is in the bottle. If you have a mostly empty bottle, it's going to make one kind of a sound. You fill it up a little bit more, it will make a different sound. That's because if, when you change the size of the column of air in the bottle, it changes its characteristic resonant frequencies. These are the frequencies at which an object uh, is easy to set vibrating uh, versus some frequencies at which it's difficult to set certain bodies vibrating. Those are not resonant frequencies. Um, other examples here, a guitar string of a certain length will have some natural resonant frequency that it likes to vibrate at or that it's easy to set it vibrating at. Um, so you can imagine this, anybody who's played a string instrument, uh, each string has a characteristic pitch, that's the frequency at which it vibrates, its fundamental frequency. If you change the length of the string uh, by putting one of your fingers on it, they call it fretting it for guitars, uh, then you will change the characteristic uh, resonant frequency of that string and the pitch will change. Um, another example, uh, if you uh, ever want to hang something heavy on your wall, um, you need to first try to find where the big wooden beams behind the wall are. Uh, this is called in English a construction stud. Um, and this is uh, a little bit tricky, right? Because you can't see behind your wall. Um, and in the old days, if you wanted to try to do this without fancy electronics, uh, you would walk around your room and knock on different parts of the wall and wait until the pitch or the resonant frequencies of the wall change, you can hear that, right? Because this is energy of you knocking is coming out as sound, and the frequencies in that sound depend on the exact shape of the stuff you're knocking on. Um, so ideally, you might be able to hear where the stud is. Now, in practice, this is incredibly hard, and I've never done it correctly, and you're much better off using an electronic stud finder. But in principle, <laughs> it does change the resonant frequencies of the part of the wall you're knocking on, whether or not there's a big piece of wood behind it. And this is all the same 
principle as why your vocal tract uh, has resonant frequencies that depend on its shape. Now the instrument examples here involve fundamental frequency, um, but your vocal tract is a little bit different because the resonant frequencies of your vocal tract don't determine the pitch or the fundamental frequency of your voice. That comes from your glottis. Uh, they instead uh, do something different, the filtering um, issue here, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Now, if a, uh, you know, a, a flute or a partially filled glass bottle um, or a guitar string had like a little motor at the end of it uh, that was producing a particularly uh, a, a way, uh, energy at a particular frequency, that would be, I guess, closer to a speech mechanism where you'd have a source and a filter. But these instrument examples work a little bit differently, just trying to illustrate that everything has frequencies that it is easier to set it vibrating at and harder to set it vibrating at. Beyond that, speech departs from most musical instruments. Right? Okay, so what are these characteristic resonant frequencies of your vocal tract going to be like? Well, it depends on the shape of your vocal tract. Uh, how are you going to change the shape of your vocal tract? You're going to move your articulators around. Right? You pull your tongue root back, it means that uh, your pharynx is going to be narrower. You raise your tongue body, it means that the middle of your vocal tract is going to be narrower than the ends. Uh, you put your lips together to block the flow of air, obviously that changes the shape of the tract. Um, so everything you do with your articulators above your larynx, your supralaryngeal articulators, everything you do with those is going to change the shape of your vocal tract, and every change in the shape of the vocal tract is going to have some consequences for the resonant frequencies of the vocal tract. So in any physical system like this, uh, energy that's fed in by your source, your vibrating vocal folds, at a natural resonant frequency for the stuff above the source, your filter, is going to pass. And that means that the air in the vocal tract will vibrate at that frequency. So we have our source here, uh, and it's feeding in energy at every harmonic, uh, every multiple of the F0. So we're getting lots and lots and lots of frequencies into the input. And whether or not those frequencies come out the other end, uh, as sound is going to depend on whether they're resonant frequencies in your vocal tract based on its current shape. Uh, if energy is coming in at a resonant frequency, it will pass. The air in the tract will vibrate at that frequency, and when you open your mouth, also energy will come out of your mouth at that frequency. If you feed energy into your vocal tract at a non-resonant frequency, then that will, be, will stop or attenuate or will be absorbed. Uh, these are all different ways of saying the same thing, uh, that your vocal tract will not vibrate at that frequency because it's not a frequency that it's easy to set your vocal tract vibrating at. It's not a natural resonant frequency. Um, so you can think of this as your source, your glottis, your vibrating vocal folds are feeding in energy uh, at just about every frequency. Of course, there's gonna be a little bit of space between individual harmonics, but it's really feeding an energy at almost every frequency you can imagine. And your vocal tract is filtering that energy based on its current shape because uh, depending on what you're doing with it, it's gonna let energy pass at some frequencies and not pass or stop or attenuate at other frequencies. The resonant frequencies of the vocal tract, as I've said, will depend on its shape and the shape of the vocal tract at any moment in time will depend on the position of the lips, teeth, tongue, etc. of your articulators. So everything we do with our articulators above the glottis, our supralaryngeal articulators, is going to affect filter properties uh, and therefore resonant frequencies uh, in our speech, and that's exactly what we find. Um, so this is the source filter model of speech, uh, and it's a super important, but also a little bit tricky and complicated to get your head around. So if you can only get one thing from this entire acoustics unit, uh, let it be the following picture. Here's what's going on here. This is a sort of diagram, schematic diagram of the source filter model of speech production. Um, and on the top here, we have things that our articulators are doing. On the bottom, we have things that the air pressure is doing, in other words, acoustic features. Um, and then these are organized 
um, where the left column here is going to be your source. The center part here is your filter. And uh, the last column here is what actually goes out into the air from your face, right? This is what's going to get recorded on whatever you're using to record the speech, a microphone, uh, an airflow monitor, your ears, right? However, wh whatever's happening to the speech uh, is coming is going to be recording this output. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, on the left here, um, this is actually a real tracking of somebody's glottal airflow over time. This is uh, the velocity, I think, of air passing through the glottis while voicing is happening. And you can see it's not a perfect sine wave. Um, it, that's because it's, again, a harmonic oscillator. Um, but it has this up and down pattern, characteristic up and down pattern. That's your source. And the frequency at which this repeats is going to be the fundamental frequency. Now, these are actual real-time units. It looks like we're going uh, from uh, one hundredth of a second to roughly two hundredths of a second um, in one cycle. Um, that means that the wave is going to be repeating roughly a hundred times a second. So this is uh, showing us an F0 of about a hundred hertz, roughly. Right? Um, what is the acoustic characteristic of that? Well, you're going to get this source spectrum where over on the vertical axis here, this is a power spectrum, we have amplitude, and on the horizontal axis, frequency. And so at 100 hertz, we're going to have some energy. And at every multiple of that, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, all the way up to about 3,000 in this picture, we're going to have a little bit less amplitude, a little bit less energy at each successive harmonic. Uh, but overall, this is basically just like a continuum where we're getting energy more or less from zero to 3000 hertz um, except that it's spaced in 100 hertz intervals because that's the fundamental frequency okay what happens to that that glottal airflow is going up into your vocal tract here and you're doing some things with your tongue and whatever that change the shape of this cavity and that's going to determine the filter, the natural resonant frequencies, uh, that uh, energy here will pass through. So you can think about taking this acoustic source wave and passing it through this series of peaks and valleys. This is what uh, any characteristic vocal tract shape is going to do. It's going to say, hey, at this frequency, it's super easy to set this vocal tract vibrating, but at this one, it's really hard. But at this one, it's easy. But at this frequency, it's hard, and so on and so forth. This particular example here has three strong peaks in its filter, three strong natural resonances. Um, and so each of these uh, is going to let lots of energy pass. Well, in between these peaks, energy is going to mostly stop or be attenuated. These peaks in the vocal tract filter function, or the natural resonances associated with a vocal tract shape, are referred to in, in phonetics as formants. And they happen at particular formant frequencies. And this is going to be one of the single most important concepts from acoustic phonetics, uh, is that sounds are defined, uh, in not entirely, but in large part, by their formant frequencies. So here we can see peaks in this function, this filter function, at about 500, 1500, and 2500 hertz. I'm guessing that this is based on a schwa vowel, although it's probably it's not a real recording, it's just an illustration. Um, but this is roughly what a schwa is gonna look like in terms of its filter properties and where the formants are, what their frequencies are. Um, of course, the output is going to depend not only on the filter, but also on what you put in as a source spectrum. So you can think about at every frequency in this source, multiply it by low numbers for non-resonant frequencies in the filter and higher numbers for uh, resonant frequencies in the filter. And just multiply every single harmonic here, you're going to get a complex spectrum that kind of looks like this. This is the output spectrum here. And uh, yeah, what you can see here is that um, there's the general overall decline that you got from the source spectrum. So it's going down as you go to the right. There's three very clear peaks that you got from the filter spectrum. These are the formant 
formants or the formant frequencies of this sound. Um, and you can see both of these clearly in the output. They're both important in determining what the output looks like. And you can also see that we're getting individual harmonics here that are higher or lower depending on the filter, um, but they're still evenly spaced at 100 hertz, right? because that's what we started with. Um, so we're getting a combination of information from the source and the spectrum in this output wave. This is what shows up on your, uh, excuse me, this is not the wave, this is the spectrum. Um, this is what will show up in your software if you do a certain kind of analysis, which I'll show you shortly. And it's going to be combining information from each of these uh, systems, the source system and the filter system. Now in physical terms, we can measure what's actually coming out of your lips, and this is basically going to be a sound wave. This is what will show up when you record something on your computer or on a microphone. It's basically tracing pressure over time. And though we know that glottal airflow and therefore pressure had this regular up and down motion at the beginning, uh, when we fed it through this filter, it changed it and it made these waves somewhat more complex. You can see that they're still repeating roughly every 10 milliseconds, just as they were over here. That doesn't change. The filter doesn't affect the fundamental frequency. That comes from the source or the glottis. But the complexity of the waves inside each of those periods has changed a lot here. And that's what the filter property is doing. You get this complex combination of information from the source and information from the filter. And when we're studying speech sounds or hearing them, presumably, we need to use this single complex output, which is what we get, in order to reconstruct what was happening with both the filter and the source. How do we know that we need to do that? Because we can hear all of these properties. We can hear uh, pitch and F0. We can hear voicing or not voicing, and we can hear formant frequencies. These correspond to all of the manner and place characteristics that speech sounds have. So this is a way to think about speech production uh, as a source filter system. Uh, now, this is extremely complicated and a little bit hard to wrap your head around because uh, it's easier to reason about physical systems if they involve sort of medium-sized objects of the type that we're used to seeing and handling and interacting with in our day-to-day -day lives. Air particles are not like that. They're tiny and we don't have a good intuitive grasp of how they work. So I have one more useful analogy here that I find helpful anyway. Um, this involves mid-sized objects that we do interact with in our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, and in particular, I want you to imagine spraying a fine mist of water uh, and having it go through a net that has a bunch of different sized and shaped holes in it. This picture really only has uh, two sizes of holes, but imagine that there's all sorts of weird irregular holes all over this net. And we're going to be standing over here in the gray oval uh, trying to figure out what happened uh, in order to produce the water that we're finding over here. So what's going on here? Um, well, the spray nozzle is going to be producing a mist of little tiny water particles. And those are going to go shooting through the air. And where the holes are in the net and how big they are and so on and so forth is going to determine whether water gets through here or not. We're standing over here. And what we're trying to do is, uh, let's pretend that we're blindfolded or something, or no, that won't work. We can only see the water that's on the ground over here or in the air over here that came through the net. And we're trying to figure out, based on that water that shows up over here, what is the net like and what is the hose like? That's basically uh, an analogy to speech. Um, <clears throat> of course, the analogy is not perfect uh, because speech is inherently dynamic in time, and this example is sort of ignoring time in order to simplify. Um, but pretend we're over here. The hose is going to be the source. The net is filtering that source, right? The individual water particles are coming over here, and they're coming through the net in different shapes that depend on the structure of the net. Um, and the water that we recover over here, where we're trying to figure out what happened, is sound. It's the output of the system. We have the input to the system, the source. 
the filter, which performs some operations on that input, and the output, where we're standing over here and trying to recover what these two things were like, just looking at the resulting patterns. So what's going on here? Well, the source, the hose, is going to determine a few things. Is the water on or off? Did you pull the trigger on the sprayer? Uh, that's basically voicing. Right? Do we get energy coming through or not coming through from this source? The size of the individual water droplets, that's going to depend on properties of the hose. Right? You change the shape of this sprayer nozzle, it's going to change the size of the little tiny water particles. And that's a little bit like F0 or harmonics. Right? What are the smallest integer units or multiples that we're going to be dealing with that come into the filter? Uh, that's determined by the source. There's a few other settings that are relevant to both the hose and to our glottises that we're going to ignore for the moment because I think this is more than enough material. Um, and uh, the filter, what is the filter going to determine? Well, it's going to determine where the water droplets come through and where they're stopped. Right? So if we're standing over here, we're going to be able to uh, recover a bunch of properties of both of these. Uh, we're going to be able to re recover uh, from the size of the droplets what was going on with the, the source um, and from whether the water is coming through or not what's going on with the source. Um, and from this, we're going to be able, to, uh, from the overall pattern that we get of water droplets coming through or not coming through, we're going to be able to figure out some things about the shape of the net, namely where are the holes and how big they are. Right? Uh, so this is a lot like speech, and you can see it's a pretty complicated problem. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to finish up source filter in another video, um, and then uh, push on into looking at vowels in more detail.